Stanford University. All right. Hello, everybody. And welcome to lecture, lecture number nine. Today, we'll do a brief recap, some organizational stuff. And then we'll talk about, I lovingly call them fancy recurrent neural networks. But those are the most important deep learning models of the day, LSTMs and GRU type models. Uh, they're very exciting and really form the base model for pretty much every deep learning paper, or almost all the deep learning papers you see out there. So after today, you'll really have in your hands the kind of tool that is the default tool for a lot of different deep learning for NLP applications. So super exciting. And the best part is you kind of know most of the important math already of it. So we can just define the model, and everything else will kind of follow through with these basic and sometimes painful building blocks that we went through before. Uh, all right, before we jump in, some organizational stuff. We have a new office hour schedule in places today. We're continuously trying to optimize the whole process uh, based on your feedback. Uh, thanks for that. So we'll have office hours every day, um, multiple times. Hope uh, that will allow us to kind of distribute the load a little bit, because I know sometimes like lots of people come to one office hour, and then there's a long wait there. So. And then um, also, it's important that you register for your GPU teams by end of day today, or ideally before, so that uh, we can make sure you all get a GPU. Uh, ideally, we also encourage uh, people to have pairs uh, for problem set three and uh, four or the, the project, um, at least pairs, because we only have 300 or so GPUs and uh, almost 700 students in the class. So try to form teams. Uh, but do make sure that you don't just have your partner work on and implement all the GPU stuff and you do all the other parts of the problem set because then you'll really miss out on a very important valuable skill for both research and applied deep learning if you don't know how to use a GPU. Uh, and then, uh, sadly, I have to get back to some work event. Um, so I'll have a pretty short office hour today. But then I know there's a, you know, we have the deadline uh, for project proposals on Thursday. So on Thursday, I'm going to have an unlimited office hour. I'm going to start after class, and we'll end when queue status is empty. So <laughs> if you come half an hour late, prepare to talk to me three hours later. So um, <laughs> it's a lot of, it's a lot. the project is the coolest part. So I don't want to discourage people from doing the project because we don't have enough. Um, so it's going to be great. Um, I'll bring food. You should bring food, too. And <laughs> um, it's going to be good fun. All right. Um, if by any chance, even after midnight, people, we still have the queue status is like still full, which I doubt at that point, I think, uh, I hope, um, then uh, we can push the, the proposals out for those. Or we can, you can submit the proposal, and then we'll figure out the, the mentor situation uh, very soon thereafter. So, all right. Any questions around any class organization? All right, then let's dive right in. So basically, today we'll have a very advanced, cutting edge blast from the past. Uh, because while pedagogically, it'll make sense uh, for us to first talk about a model from 2014, from just three years ago, uh, the main model we'll end up with, uh, the long short term memory, is actually a very old model from 97 and has kind of been dormant for a while. Uh, it's a very powerful model. You need a lot of training data for it need fast machines for it. But now that we have those two things, this is a very powerful model for NLP. And if you ask uh, one of the inventors, uh, the second model is really just a special case of the LSTM. But I think pedagogically, it makes sense to sort of first talk about uh, the so-called gated recurrent unit, which is a slightly simpler version. And we'll use machine translation, which is one of the sort of most useful tasks, you might argue, uh, of NLP, it's sort of a real life task something that actual people outside academia, outside research, and outside linguistics really care about. Um, and by the end, you'll actually have basically the skills to build uh, one of the best machine translation models out there, modulo a lot of time and some extra effort. Um, but the, most, the, most, uh, the biggest parts of 90% of, of the top MT systems out there, you'll be able to understand at least and probably build also if you have the GPU skills after this class. All right. so. I'm not going to go through too many of the details, but in just in preparation to mentally uh, make you also think about the midterm that's coming up. Uh, next lecture, we'll have midterm review. But ideally, you these kinds of equations that I'm throwing up here, you're pretty familiar with at this point. You're like, oh, yeah, I just you know do some negative sampling here from my work to VEC. 
and I have my inside and my outside vectors in the window. And similarly for glove, uh, you have you know, two sets of vectors, you optimize this, you have a function here that limits how important uh, very frequent pairs are in your co-occurrence matrix. You understand the max margin uh, objective function. You have scores of good windows from a large training corpus and corrupted windows. So all of these should be familiar, and if not, then you really should also start thinking about um, sort of studying again for, uh, for the midterm. And then the most basic definition of a neural net, where we just have some score at the end or some softmax, and uh, really being comfortable with these two final equations that if you understand those, all the rest of the models will basically be, in many cases, sort of fancy versions or, or adapted versions of these two equations. So that's important. And then we'll have uh, our standard recurrent neural network that we already went through, and we kind of assume uh, you should know for the midterm as well. And our grade of cross entropy error as one of the main loss or objective functions that we optimize. And when we optimize, we usually use the mini-batched SGD. We don't go through a single example, we don't go through the entire batch of our training data, but we take you know, 100 or so uh, of examples each time we train. So all those concepts, you should feel reasonably comfortable with now. Um, and if not, then definitely come work to the office hours and, and start uh, sort of studying up for the midterm. All right, and we'll go over more midterm details in the next lecture. All right, now on to the main topic of today, machine translation. So you might think uh, for some NLP tasks that you can get away with thinking of all the rules that, for instance, sentiment analysis might be, might, a sentence might come out positive or negative, right? You say, oh, I have a list of all the positive words, a list of all the negative words, and I can think of the ways you can negate positive words and things like that. And you could maybe conceive of creating a sentiment analysis system of just all your intuitions about linguistics and sentiment. That kind of approach is completely ridiculous for machine translation. There's no way you will ever, nobody will ever be able to think of all the different rules and exceptions for translating all possible sentences of one language to another. So basically, uh, the baseline that's pretty well established is that all machine translation systems are somewhat statistical in nature. We'll always try to take a very large corpus, in fact, we'll have so-called parallel corpora, where we have a lot of sentences or paragraphs in one language, and we know that this paragraph in this language translates to that paragraph in another language. One of the most popular parallel corpora of all of, like, for a long time, for the last couple thousand years, is the Bible, for instance. You have Bible translated that has nice paragraphs, and each paragraph is translated in different languages. That would be, like, one of the first sort of um, parallel corpora. The very first is actually the Rosetta Stone, which allowed people to have at least some uh, understanding of uh, ancient, uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, and uh, it's pretty, pretty exciting uh, if, you're, if you're sort of into historical linguistics. Um, and uh, yeah, it will allow us basically to translate those to the Demotic script and the ancient uh, Greek uh, also, which we still know. And so we can kind of gain some intuition about what's going on in the other two. Now, in the next couple of slides, I will basically try to bring across to you that traditional statistical machine translation systems are very, very complex beasts. And it would have been impossible for me to say at the end of the lecture, oh, and now you could implement this whole thing yourself after just one lecture going over MT, because there are a lot of different moving parts. So let's walk through this. And this is, you, do, you won't have to actually implement a traditional statistical MT system in this class but I want you to sort of appreciate a little bit the history and why deep learning is so impactful and amazing for machine translation, because uh, it's replacing a lot of different sub-modules and these very complex models. So, and sometimes it uses still ideas from this, but not, not most of them we don't need anymore uh, for neural machine translation systems. All right, so let's set uh, the stage. We have uh, generally a source language. Let's call that F. Uh, such as French, and we have a target language E. In our case, let's say it's English, so we're going to translate from the source French to the target language of English. And we'll usually, usually uh, we describe this here uh, with a simple Bayes rule where we basically try to find the target sentence, usually E here we assume is the whole sentence in the target language, that gives us the largest conditional probability 
conditioned on f. So this is a sort of an abstract formulation. We'll try to fill in how to actually compute these probabilities in traditional and then later in neural machine translation systems. So now we can use Bayes' rule, you know, posterior equals prior times likelihood divided by marginal evidence. Marginal evidence here would just be for the source language, so that doesn't change, so we can drop that. argmax would not change from that. So we can basically, we'll try to compute these two uh, factors here, the probability of the French sentence given, or the source language given the target, times uh, the probability of just the target. And now we'll basically call these two elements here. One is our translation model, and the other one is our language model. Remember language modeling, where we tried to get the probability of a longer sequence? This is a great use case for it. Uh, basically, you can think of this as you get some French sentence. Your translation model will kind of try to find like maybe this phrase I can translate into that, and this phrase could translate into this. And then you have a bunch of pieces of English, and then your language model will essentially, uh, in the decoder, be combined to try to get a single smooth sentence in the target language. So it'll kind of help us to take all these pieces that we have from the translation model and make it into one sentence that actually sounds kind of reasonable and flows and is grammatical and all that. So the language model helps us to weight grammatical sentences better. So for instance, I go home will sound better than I go house. Right, because I go home, uh, we'll have a more likely, a higher probability, it's a more likely English sentence to be uttered. Now, how do we actually train all these different pieces and how would you go about doing this? Well, if you wanted to translate, uh, do this translation model here, then the first thing you'd have to do is you'd find ali so-called alignments, which is basically you know, the goal of the alignment step is to know which word or phrase in the source language would translate to the other word or phrase in the target language. And that sub-problem already, and now you know we're, again, we have these three different systems, and now we're zooming into the step one of that system. Now that one is already kind of hard because alignment is non-trivial. Uh, if you, these are actually some cool examples from uh, previous incarnation from Chris's class, 224, uh, and from previous years. Uh, here are some examples of why alignment is already hard, and this is for a sentence, uh, sorry, a language pair that is actually quite similar. You know, English and French share a lot of common history and so on, and they're, they're more similar. But even if we have these two sentences here, like Japan shaken by two new quakes, or le Japon zécoué par de nouveaux zéismes, then we'll basically have here a spurious word. So le was actually not translated to anything, and we would skip it. Um, in our alignment. So you kind of see here an um, alignment matrix, and you'll notice that le just wasn't translated. We don't say the Japan or a Japan or something like that. So it gets, it gets uh, trickier, though, because there are also so-called zero fertility words that are not translated at all. So we start in a source, and we just drop them. And for some reason, the translators, or for grammatical reasons and so on, they, are, they don't actually have any equivalent uh, for the in, the, in the target language. And to make it even more complex, we can also have one-to-many alignments. So implemented uh, in English is actually mise en application in French. So made into an application of sorts is, uh, is just the word and the verb implemented here. So then we'll have to try to find, and now as you try to think of through algorithms that might do this alignment for you, you'll have to think, oh, so this word could go to either this one word or no word or these three words together or maybe these two words together. You know, and you can see how that would create if you try to go through all the statistics and collect all of these probabilities of which phrase would go to what phrase. It'll get hard, pretty hard to actually combine them all. And you know, language is, is just incredible and very complex. And you also have many to one alignments. So Aboriginal people are just uh, autochtone in French, right? So the, uh, similar, actually, in German, autochtone Bevölkerung, so you'd have two words in German. And so, you know, you have many-to-one alignments, making the sort of uh, combinatorial explosion even harder if you try to find good alignments. And lastly, you also have many-to-many -many alignments, right? You have certain phrases, like, don't have any money. Uh, this just goes to the song Demuni uh, in French. And so, 
it's a very, very complex problem that has a combinatorial explosion of all potential combinations, and it's tricky. All right, so now, um, really, if you were to take a traditional uh, class, you could have several lectures, uh, or at least an entire lecture, just on the various ways you could implement uh, cleverly an alignment model. And uh, sometimes people use just single words, and other times they actually use parses, like the one you're now familiar with, syntactic parses, and try to find which, you know, not just words, but phrases from a parse would map uh, to, other, uh, to the other language. And then, of course, it's not just that, and, and not usually are sentences and languages nicely aligned, but you can also have uh, completely re or complete reorderings. So German sometimes uh, for sub uh, clauses actually has the verb at the end, so you flip a lot of the words, and you can just have this locality assumption that words roughly in this area will translate to roughly a similar area uh, in terms of the sequence of words in the other language. So yeah, ja nicht here. Uh, ja is technically just yes in German, also not translated at all, and then actually going over there and going, moving also. All right, now let's say we have all these potential alignments, and now as we start from the source language, we say, all right, let's say um, the source here is this German sentence, er geht ja nicht nach Hause, and now er could be translated into many different, uh, different words. So German, it's technically just the he, of he, she, it, uh, as he, s in German. Uh, but sometimes uh, English, you know, as you do your alignment, one not unreasonable one is just it, or a comma he, or he will be, because those were dropped before in the alignment, and so on. So you now have lots of candidates for each possible word and for each possible phrase that you might want to combine now in some principled way to the final target translation. So you have again here a combinatorial explosion of lots of potential ways you could translate each of the words or phrases of various lengths. And so basically what that means is you'll have a very hard search problem that uh, also includes having to have a good language model so that as you put all these pieces together, uh, you essentially try to keep saying or combining phrases that are grammatically plausible or sound reasonable to, to native speakers. And this often ends up being a so-called beam search, where you try to keep around a couple of candidates as you go from left to right and you try to put all of these different pieces together. Now, again, this is totally not doing traditional MT justice, right? We just went in five minutes over what could have been an entire lecture on statistical machine translation, or maybe even many multiple lectures. Uh, so there are lots of important details we, we skipped over, but the main gist here is that there's a lot of human feature engineering that's required and involved in all of these different pieces that used to require building a machine translation system. And it also meant that there were whole companies that you could form just for machine translation because nobody could go through all that work and really build out a good system. Whereas now, you have companies that have worked for decades in this and they start using an open source machine translation system that anybody can download. And a normal student can now implement, uh, you know, a PhD student can spend a couple months and then he has like one of the best MT systems, which just completely, would have been completely impossible and there are large groups that all work together on very large systems before uh, in academia. So one of the main problems of this kind of approach is actually that not only are they, it's a very complex system, but it's also a system of independently trained machine learning models. And if there's one thing that I think uh, that I like most, one property of deep learning models, not just for MT, but in, in all of NLP and maybe in all of AI, is that we're usually in uh, deep learning try to have end-to-end -end trainable models, where you have this, your final objective function that you care about, and everything is learned jointly in one model. And this MT system is kind of the opposite of that. You have an alignment model, you optimize for that. And then you have a reordering model maybe, and then you have uh, a, you know, the language model, and they're all separate systems, and you couldn't jointly train all of it together. So that is kind of the very quick summary for traditional machine translation. Any, any high-level questions? Around traditional MT. All right. So now, deep learning to the rescue, maybe, probably. Um, 
So let's go through a sequence of models uh, and see if they would suffice. So the simplest one that we could possibly do um, is kind of an encoder decoder model uh, that looks like this, where we literally just have a single recurrent neural network where we have our word vectors. So let's say here we translate from German to English, echtdicke Kiste is awesome sauce in English. And we now have our word vectors here. We learned them in German. And we have our softmax classifier here. And we just have a single recurrent neural network. And once it sees the end of a German sentence and there's no input left, we'll just try to output the translation. Not totally unreasonable. It's an end-to-end -end trainable model. We'll have our standard cross-entry pair here that tries to just predict the next word, but the next word actually has to be in a different, different language. Now, uh, basically this last vector here, if this was our main model, this last vector would have to capture the entirety of the phrase. And sadly, I've already told you that usually five or six words or so uh, can be captured. And after that, we don't really, we can't memorize the entire context of the sentence before. So this might work for like very short sentences, but Maybe not, but let's, let's define what this model would be uh, in its most basic form because we'll work uh, on top of this afterwards. So we have here our standard recurrent neural network from the last lecture where we have our next hidden state. It's just uh, basically a linear uh, network here followed by non element wise nonlinearities. Uh, and we sum here the matrix vector product with the vector, the previous hidden state and our current <coughs> word vector xt. And that's our encoder. And then in our decoder, in the simplest form, again, not the final model, in the simplest form, we could just drop this because the decoder doesn't have an input at that time, right? It's just like we want to now translate and just generate an output. So during the decoder, we drop this matrix vector product and we just go each time step. It's just uh, basically moving along based on the previous hidden time step. And we'll have our final softmax output here at each time step of the decoder. Now, I also introduced this phi notation here. Uh, and basically, whenever you have, when we'll see this only in the next couple of slides, but whenever I write phi of two vectors, that means we'll have two separate W matrices for each of these vectors. This is a little shorter notation. And then the default here would be, we'll just, like I said, minimize the cross entropy error for all the target words conditioned on all the source words that we hope would be captured in that hidden state. All right. Any questions, concerns, thoughts about how this model would do? So uh, the comment or question is that the, neither the traditional model or this model account for grammar. And in some ways, that's not true. So uh, you can, there are actually a lot of traditional models that work on top of syntactic grammatical tree structures. And they do this alignment based on the syntactic structure of, uh, you know, for, for potentially the alignment step, but also for the generation and the encoding step and all these different steps. So there are several ways you can in, infuse grammar and grammatical sort of priors into neural machine translation systems or sort of uh, syntactic uh, machine translation systems. It turns out it's questionable if that actually helps. In many cases, uh, for machine translation, you have such a broad range of sentences, you actually might have ungrammatical sentences sometimes, and you still want them to be translated. Um, you have very short, complex, ambiguous kinds of sentences like headlines and so on. So it's, it's tricky. The jury was sort of out, and the syntactic models were battling it out with, with non-syntactic models until neural machine translation came and now uh, it's not as important of a question anymore. Now for neural systems, we would assume and hope that our hidden state actually captures some grammatical structures and some grammatical intuitions that we have, but we don't explicitly give that to the algorithm anymore, which some people who are very good at giving those kinds of uh, uh, features to algorithms might think is, is sad, but at the same time, it's good if we don't have to, right? It's less work for us, more putting more artificial back into artificial intelligence, um, less human intelligence on designing grammars. Um, anyway, so any, any other questions? Yeah.
Good question. So sometimes the number of input words uh, is different to the number of output words, and that's very true. So uh, one modification we would have to make uh, to this kind of model for sure is to actually say, have the last uh, output word here be a don't con like stop outputting words word, like a special token that says, I'm done. And when you add that to your softmax classifier, sort of the last, uh, the last row, and then you hope that when it predicts that token, it just stops. And that is good enough um, and not uncommon, actually, for uh, all these neural machine translation systems. Yeah, it's a good catch. Yeah. Uh, the superscript S here is just, again, to distinguish the different W uh, matrices that we have for hidden hidden connections, hidden uh, visible or hidden inputs, and softmax. That's the softmax W. All right. Now, sadly, while neural MT is pretty cool and is simpler than traditional systems, it's not quite that simple. Uh, so we'll have to be a little more clever. And so let's go through a series of extensions uh, to this model, uh, where in the end we'll have a very big, powerful uh, LSTM type model. So step one is we'll actually have different recurrent neural network weights for encoding and decoding. So instead of having the same W here, we actually should have a different set of parameters, a different uh, W for the decoding step. That's still relatively similar. All right, so again, remember this notation here of phi, where every input has its own matrix W associated with it. Um, the second modification is that the previous hidden state is kind of the standard um, that you have as input uh, for during decoding. But instead of just having the previous hidden state, we'll actually also add the last hidden vector of the encoding. So we call this C here, but it's essentially HT. So at this input here, we don't just have the previous hidden state, but we always take the last hidden state from the encoding step. And we have, again, a separate matrix for that. And then on top of that, we will also add, and this actually, if you think about it, is a lot of parameters, we add the previous predicted output word. So as we translate, we have three inputs for each hidden state during the decoding step. We'll have the previous hidden state as a standard recurrent neural network. We have the last hidden state of the encoder. And we have the actual output word we predicted just before that. And this will essentially help the model to know that it just output a word. And it'll prevent it from outputting that word again. Right? Because it'll learn to transform the hidden state based on having just output a specific word before. That's right, that's right, yeah. So whenever you have phi of x, y, z here, it'll just be f of w times x plus u of y plus v of z. So you just, I don't want to define all the matrices. That's a great question. So why do we need to make y uh, t minus 1 a parameter if we actually had computed y uh, t minus 1 from h t minus 1, right? So two answers. One, uh, it will allow us to have the softmax uh, weights also modify a little bit how that hidden state behaves at test time. And two, we actually can choose usually y t and there are different ways you can do this. Uh, some, you could take the actual probability the multinomial distribution from the softmax, but here we'll actually make a hard choice and we'll choose, we'll actually tell the model we chose exactly this one. So instead of having the distribution, we'll make a hard choice and we say, this was the one word, the highest probability, that had the highest probability, we predicted that one, and that's the one we give as input. So it turns out in practice that helps to prevent the model from repeating uh, words many times. And again, it incorporates the softmax weights in that computation indirectly. That is a good catch. Um, that is not how we define the model. Ignore those errors. Yeah. Well done. In theory, again, so um, I didn't define it, but you can also you can do the same thing with the softmax, and this is what 
the picture actually shows. So instead of having a softmax of just w h t minus or h t for pro probability of y t, uh, you can also concatenate here your c. And that's what the picture said, but I wanted to skip over the details, so you caught it. Well done. <coughs> So this model usually, uh, so the question is, do we have kind of a look ahead type thing or does the model output blanks? And the model uh, basically has to output the words in the right order. And it has not, it doesn't have the ability to uh, do this whole reordering step or look ahead kind of thing or, you know, there's no sort of post-processing of reordering at the end. So if this model isn't able to output the verb at the right time step, it's over. Now, of course, once it works well, everybody will try to see if they can kind of improve it, and eventually you can do beam searches too for these kinds of models. But surprisingly, in many cases, you don't have to, to get a reasonable MT system. All right, now I want you to become more and more familiar to be able to read the literature. So the same picture that we had here and the same equations we defined, here's another way of looking at this. Um, so with the exception that this one doesn't have the C connection that you caught. Um, so yeah, it's, it's similar, it's the same exact model, uh, just a different way to look at it. Uh, and it's kind of good to, to see. Sometimes people explicitly write um, uh, that you start out with a discrete one of K encoding of the words. It's just like your one hot vectors that we defined. And then you embed it into a continuous word vector space. You give those as input, you compute your recurrent neural network, HT steps, and now you give those as input to the decoder, and that each at each time stick of the decoder, you get the one word sample that you actually took as input, the previous hidden state, and the C vector we defined before. So all these three are the, out, the inputs for each node in this recurrent neural network. So just a different picture for the same, the same model we just defined. So you learn picture invariances for model semantics. All right, now it gets uh, more, more powerful. It needs to get more powerful because even with those two assumptions here, we have a very simple recurrent neural network with just one layer that's not going to cut it. So we'll use some of the extensions uh, we discussed uh, in the last lecture. We'll actually have stacked deep uh, recurrent neural networks where we have multiple layers. And then we'll also have, uh, in some cases, this is not as, as common, but uh, sometimes it's used. We have a, a bidirectional encoder where we go from left to right and then we give both the you know, last hidden states of both directions as input to every step of the decoder. And then uh, this is kind of uh, almost an X or here. If you don't do this, then another way to improve uh, your system slightly is by training the input sequence in reverse order because then you have a simpler optimization problem. So for, especially for languages that align reasonably well, like English and French, uh, you might, instead of saying A, B, C, the, the words A, the word B, word C, goes to, in the different language, the words X and Y, you'll say C, B, A goes to X, Y. Because as they align, a is more likely to translate to X and B is more likely to Y. And as, as you have longer sequences, you basically bring the words that are actually being translated closer together. And hence, you have less of uh, gradient, uh, vanishing gradient problems and so on, because where you want the word to be predicted is closer to where it came in to the encoder. Yeah. That's right. But yeah, it's still, it's still an average. Still on average works. So how does reversing not mess it up? Because the sentence doesn't make grammatical sense. So we never gave this model an explicit grammar for, uh, for the source language or the target language, right? It's essentially trying in some really deep, clever, continuous function, general function approximation kind of way, just Correlation, basically, right? And 
it doesn't have to know the grammar, uh, but as long as you're consistent and you just reverse every sequence the same way, it's still grammatical if you read it from the other side and you know the model reads it from potentially both sides and so on. So it doesn't really matter um, to deep learning models as long as your transformation of the input is consistent across training and testing times and so on. So the question is, uh, he understands the argument, but it could still change the meaning. And it doesn't change the meaning if you assume the model will always go from one direction to the other. If you start to sometimes do it and sometimes not, then it will totally mess up the system. But as long as it's a consistent transformation, it is still the same order, and so you're good. So why is reversing the order a simpler optimization problem? Imagine you had a very long sequence here. Uh, and again, this is only the case if the languages align well, as in usually the first couple of words in one, the source language, translate to the first couple of words in the target language. Now, if you have a long sequence and you try to translate it to another long sequence, let's say there are a lot of them here. Now, what that would mean is that this word here is very far away from that word because it has to go through this entire uh, transformation. And likewise, these words are also very far away. So everything is far away from everything in terms of having the number, the, a number of non-linear function applications before you get to the actual output. Now, if you just reverse this one, then this word, so let's call this a, B, C, B, E, F. Now, if this is now F, E, D, C, B, A. Now, this word is here now, and now this word translates directly to that word, right? So in your decoder. So now these two are very, very close to one another. And so as you do uh, backpropagation, and we learned of, about the vanishing gradient problem in the last lecture. You have much less of a vanishing gradient problem, so at least in the beginning, it'll be much better at translating those. So how does, it, uh, how does this trick work uh, for languages with different morphology? It doesn't actually matter, but the sad truth is also that very few MT researchers work on languages with super complex morphology. Uh, so like Finnish is not, doesn't have very large parallel corpora uh, with tons of other languages. And so you don't sadly see as many people work on that. German does work, and for German actually a lot of other tricks uh, that we'll get to. And really these tricks are not as important as the one I'm, as uh, trick number six, but before that we'll have a research highlight. Give you a bit of a break. All right, Alan, take it away. I'll just end with this. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan. So I'm going to talk about uh, building towards uh, a better language modeling. So as we've learned last week, uh, language modeling is one of the most canonical tasks in NLP. And there are three different ways we can make it a little bit better. We can have better input representation, we can have better regularization or pre-processing, and eventually we can have uh, a better model. So for input, um, I know you guys have all played with Golov, and that's a word level uh, representation. And I heard morphemes, uh, you guys were down there. So uh, in fact, you can encode the word uh, at sub-word level. You can do morpheme encoding, you can do BP, you can do eventually do character level embedding. What it does is that it drastically reduces the size of your vocabulary, makes the, uh, the, the, the model prediction uh, much easier. So as you can see, Thomas McLove in 2012 and Yung Kim uh, in 2015 explore this route and got better result compared to uh, just plain word-based models. Um, so another way to improve your model is that one, one of the bigger problems for language modeling is overfitting. And we know that we need to apply regularization techniques when the model is overfitting. Um, so there are a bunch of them, but today I'm going to focus on pre-processing because it's a little bit newer. 
Uh, what pre-processing does is that we know that we're not, e even if we have un like, we're never going to have unlimited training data. So in order to have our corpus uh, look more like the true distribution of the English language, what we can do is quite similar to computer vision. We can um, do this type of like data augmentation technique where we try to replace some word in our corpus with some other words. So for example, uh, your model during the first pass, you can see a word called New York. Uh, the next pass, you can see New Zealand. The next pass, you can see New England. So by doing that, you're, you're basically generating this data uh, by yourself and eventually you achieve a smooth out distribution. The reason this happens is that more frequent word uh, by replacing, by dropping them, uh, they appear less often and rarer words by making them appear, they appear more often. Uh, so a smooth um, distribution allow us to learn a better language model. And the result is on the, I think it's on the right hand side uh, of you guys. And the left hand side is uh, what happened when we apply better regularization techniques. Um, so at last we can, oh, wait. Oh, that's it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, guys. All right. Now, what you'll also see in these tables is that the default for all these models is an LSTM. And that's exactly what we'll end up very soon with, uh, which is basically a better type of recurrent unit. And so, We'll just start uh, with gated recurrent units that were introduced uh, by Cho and just three years ago. And the main idea is that we want to basically keep around memories that capture long distance dependencies. And you want to have the model learn when and how to do that. And with that, you also allow your error messages to flow differently at different strengths depending on the input. So how does this work? What is a GRU? as our step uh, to the LSTM. And sometimes you don't need to go all the way to the LSTM. The GRU is a really good model by itself uh, in many cases already, and it's simpler. So let's start with our standard recurrent neural network, which basically computes our hidden layer at the next time step directly. So we just have, again, previous hidden state, current word vector, that's it. Now instead, uh, what we'll do for gated recurrent units, or GRUs, is we'll compute two gates first. These gates are also just like HT, uh, continuous vectors of the same length as the hidden state. And they are computed exactly the same way. And here, it's important to note the superscripts that just basically are aligned with the kind of gate that you're computing. So we'll compute a so-called update gate and a reset gate. Now, the inside here is the exact same thing, but it's important to note that we have here a sigmoid function. So we'll have elements of this vector that are exactly between 0 and 1. And we could interpret them as probabilities if we want to. And it's also important to note that the superscripts here are different. So the update gate, of course, uses a different set of weights to the reset gate. Now, why are they called update and reset gate, and how do we use them? Uh, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, we actually, we just introduced one new uh, function here, which is the element-wise product. We remember it from backpropagation. We also call it the Hadamard product sometimes, where we just element-wise multiply uh, this vector here from the reset gate with this, uh, which would be our new memory content. We call it h tilde. It's our intermediate memory content. It has the standard 10h that we also know as a nonlinearity. This part here is exactly the same. We just have as input our word vector linear and transformed with a W. But what's going on in here? So intuitively, right, this is again just a long vector uh, of numbers between 0 and 1. Now intuitively, if this reset gate at a certain unit is around 0, then we essentially ignore all the past. We ignore that entire computation of the past and we're just going to define that element where r is 0 with the current word vector. Now, why would we want to do that? What's the intuition here? Let's take uh, the task of sentiment analysis, because it's very simple and intuitive. If you were to say uh, you're talking about a plot of a movie review, and you talk about the plot, and you know some girl falls in love with some guy, he falls in love with her, but then they can't meet, blah, blah, blah. Lots of long, long plot. And then in the end, you say, but the movie was really boring. 
then really it doesn't matter that you keep around that whole plot. You want to say boring is a really negative, strong word for sentiment, and you want to basically be able to, uh, to allow the model to ignore the previous plot summary, because for the task of sentiment analysis, it's irrelevant. Now, this is essentially what the reset gate will let you do, but of course not in this global fashion where you update the entire hidden state, but in this more subtle way where you learn uh, which of the units you actually will reset and which ones you will keep around. So this will allow some of the units to say, well, maybe I want to be a plot unit and I will keep around the plot, but other units learn, well, if I see one of these sentiment words, I will definitely set that reset gate to zero and I will now make sure that I don't wash out uh, the, my main content with previous stuff by summing these two, right? You're sort of like, not quite averaging, but you're summing the two, so you wash out the content uh, from this word, and instead it'll set that to zero and take only the content from that current word. Now, the final memory that will compute uh, will combine this with the update gate. And the update gate now does something similar, but uh, basically allows us to keep around only the past and not the future, so, or not the current time step. So intuitively here, when you look at z, if z is a vector of all ones, uh, then what we would do is essentially do ht equals ht minus one, plus one minus one is zero, so this term falls away. So basically now, if zt was all ones, we could just copy over our previous time step. Super powerful. If you copied over the previous time step, you have no vanishing gradient problem. Right? Your vector just gets you know, a bunch of ones. Nothing changes in your gradient computation. So that's very powerful. And intuitively, you can use that same sentiment example, but you say in the beginning, man, I love this movie so much. Here's this beautiful love story. And now you go through the love story. And really what's important for sentiment is not about the love story, but it's about the person saying, I love this movie a lot. And you want to make sure you don't lose that information. And with the standard recurrent neural network, we update our hidden time state every time, every word. No matter how unimportant a word is, we're going to sum up those two vectors, washing out the content as we move further and further along. Here, we can decide. And what's even more amazing, you don't have to decide. You don't say, oh, this word is positive, so I'm going to set my reset gate manually. No, the model will learn when to reset and when to update. So this is a very simple kind of modification, but it's extremely powerful. Now, we're going to go through it and explain it a couple more times. Um, and we'll try to have uh, an attempt here at a clean illustration. Honestly, personally, I feel like the equations here are so straightforward and very intuitive that I don't know if these illustrations always help, but uh, some people like them more than others. Um, so intuitively here, um, you basically see that only the final memory uh, that you compute it is the one that actually is used as input to the next step. So all of these are only modifying through uh, the final state. And now this one gets as input to our reset gate, our update gate, the intermediate state, and the final state of the memory. And so does our, our x vector, the word vector here, also gets as input to the reset gate, the update gate, and our intermediate memory state. And then I try to use this uh, so the dotted line here as basically gates that modify how these two interact. All right, so I, I said I think most of these things already, but again, reset, reset gate here is close to zero. We ignore our previous state, and that again allows the model in general to drop information that is irrelevant for the future predictions that it wants to make. And if we update uh, the update gate Z controls, how much of the past state should matter at the current time step. And again, this is a huge improvement for the vanishing gradient problem, which allows us to actually train these models on non-trivial long sequences. Any questions around the GRU? Yep. Does it matter if you reset first or update first? Well, so you can compute H until you have H tilled. So the order of these two doesn't matter. You can compute that in parallel, but you first have to compute uh, h-tilde with the reset gate before you can compute that one.
Hmm. Um, so the question is, does it matter to switch and use an equation like this first and then an equation like that? Um, I guess it's just a different model. Um, it's not one that I know of people having tried. Um, it's not super unreasonable. There's an, I don't see a um, sort of reason why it would be illogical to ever do that. Um, but yeah, it's just not the GRU model. You will actually see, and uh, Shane here actually has a paper on a, a search space Odyssey type uh, paper where there are a thousand modifications you can make to the next model, the LSTM, and people have tried a lot of them. And uh, it's, it's not trivial. There's yeah, there are a lot of modifications, and a lot of times they you know, seem kind of intuitive, but don't actually change performance that much across a bunch of different tasks. But sometimes one modification improves things a tiny bit uh, on one of the tasks. It turns out the final model the GRU here and the LSTM are actually incredibly stable across, like they give good performance across a lot of different tasks. But it can't ever hurt to, you know, if you have some intuition of why you want to have make something different, uh, it can't hurt to try. Um, so the question is, uh, is it important of how they're computed? Um, I think there's some people who've tried once to have like a two-layer neural network to compute these uh, Z and up the Z and R. Um, in general, it matters, of course, a, a lot how they're computed, but not in the sense that you have to modify them manually or something. It's just the model learns when to update and when not to update. That's a, good, that's a good question. So the, when I, what do I mean when I say unit? So in general, what uh, you'll observe uh, in uh, a slide that's coming up very soon is that we will kind of abstract away from the details of what these equations are. And we're going to write uh, that just ht equals g r u of x t and h t minus 1. And then we'll just say that GRU abbreviation means all these other things, all these equations, and we're going to abstract away from that. And that's something that you'll see even more in subsequent le lectures where you just say a whole recurrent neural network with a five-layer GRU and combined with lots of different ways is just like one block. Um, we often see this in computer vision too, where CNNs are now just like, this is CNN block, and you assume you get a feature vector out at the end, and people will start abstracting away more and more from that. Um, but yeah, you always have to remember that, yes, there's a lot of complexity inside, inside that unit. Uh, here's another attempt at an illustration, which I'm even less of a fan of um, than the one I try to come up with. Uh, it's basically how you have your, your Z gate that kind of you know, can jump back and forth, but of course it's usually continuous type thing. It's not a zero one type thing. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of this kind of illustration. Um, and so in terms of derivatives, uh, we could in theory ask you to derive all the details of the GRU. And the only uh, change here is that we now have the derivative of these element wise multiplications, both of which have parameters or inside. And we all should know what the derivative of this is. Uh, and the rest is, again, the same kind of chain rule. But again, now you're sort of realizing why we want to modularize this more and more and abstract away from actually manually taking these instead uh, having uh, error messages and deltas uh, sent around. Yeah. Explain why we have both uh, update and reset. So basically, it helps the model to have different mechanisms for when to memorize something and keep it around versus when to update it. You're right. In theory, you could try to put both of those uh, into one thing, right? In theory, you'd say, well, if this was just um, my, previous, uh, my previous H T here, then uh, this could say, well, I want to keep it around or I want to update it here. But now this update here, if you just had an equation like this, it would still be a sum of two things. So that means that xt here does not have complete control over 
modifying the current hidden state in its entirety. It would still be summed up with something else, and that happens at every single time step. So it's only once you have this reset gate R here, this reset gate R here, that you would allow H to be completely dominated by the current word vector, if the model so chooses. Uh, if the reset gates are all, okay, so if these are all ones, um, then you have here basically a standard uh, recurrent neural network type equation. And then if you just uh, have z's all zeros, then you take that exact equation and you're right. Then you just have a standard RNN, which is also beautiful. It's always nice to say my model is a more general form of your model or <laughs> an opposite, your, your model is a special case of my model. Um, <laughs> There's actually a cup uh, a couple of years ago that you could buy that said that. Um, it's good, good machine learning banter. Um, so yeah, it's always good. And likewise, uh, the inventor of this model made exactly that statement around the, about the GRU, not knowing why anybody had to publish uh, a new paper about this instead of uh, just referring to this and the special cases uh, of the LSTM. So um, if we have one more question about the GRU. Good question. Why, why 10H and sigmoid? So in theory, you could say the 10H here could be a rectified linear unit or other kind of unit. Um, in practice, uh, you do want sigmoids here because you have this, this plus you know, one minus that. And so if they're all over the place, then everything will be kind of modified. And it's less intuitive that you have a kind of have a hard reset and a hard sort of yeah, hard reset or hard update. Um, and if, if this wasn't 10H, then and was rectif rectified linear unit, then these two might be all over the place too, and then it would be kind of easy to potentially have this sum also be not very sensical. Uh, but at the same time, it's not unreasonable to try having a rectified linear unit here, and maybe if you combine it with proper regularization and so on, you could get away with other kinds of nonlinearities. Yeah, it's unlike you know, probabilistic graphical models where certain things just make no sense and you can't do them in deep learning, you can often try some things and sometimes uh, even nonsensical things surprisingly work and then other people will try to analyze why that was the case in the first place. But yeah, so there's no, no mathematical reasons why you couldn't at all have a rectified linear unit here. All right, now on to an even more complex sort of overall recurrent unit, uh, namely the long short term memories or LSTMs. Now this is the uh, hippest uh, model of the day and it's pretty important to, to know it well. Fortunately it's again very similar to the kinds of basic building blocks but now we allow each of the different uh, steps to have again even we, we separate them out even more. So how do we separate them out? Basically this is what's going on at each time step. We'll have an input gate, forget gate, an output gate, a memory cell, a final memory, and a final hidden state. Now, let's gain a little bit of intuition, and there is good intuition of why we want any of them. So the input gate will basically determine how much we will care about the current vector at all. So how much does the current cell or the current input word vector matter? The forget gate is a separate mechanism that just says, maybe I should forget, Maybe I don't. Uh, in this case here, it's kind of counterintuitive sometimes, and there are actually different uh, models in the literature. Some have a one minus there and others don't. But in general here, we'll define our forget gate. If it's zero, then we're forgetting the past. Then we have an output gate. Uh, basically, in, when you have this output gate, you will separate out what matters um, to a certain prediction versus what matters to keeping, to being kept around over the current recurrent time steps. So you might say, at this current time step, this particular cell is not important, but it will become important later. And so I'm not going to output it to my final softmax, for instance, but I'm still gonna keep it around. So it's yet another separate mechanism to learn when to do that. And then uh, we have our new memory cell here, which is similar to what we had before. So in fact, all these Four here have the same equation inside and just three sigmoid nonlinearities and one 10H nonlinearity. Right, so these are all just four 
single layer neural nets. Now, we'll put all of these gates together when we compute uh, the memory cell in the final hidden state. So the final memory cell now basically separated out the input and the forget gate. Instead of just Z and one minus Z, we have two separate mechanisms that can be trained uh, and learn slightly different things and actually become also, in some ways, uh, counterintuitive. Like you say, I, I don't want to forget, but or you do want to forget, but you also input something right now. Um, uh, but the model turns out to, to work very well. Um, so basically here, we have final hidden state. It's just a forget gate, Hadamard product, with the previous hidden state's final memory cell C t minus 1. So this, again, will determine how much do you want to keep this around or how much do we want to forget from the past. And then the new memory cell here, this has a standard recurrent neural net. If i is all ones, then we really keep the input uh, around. And if the input gate says, no, this one doesn't matter, then you just basically ignore the current word vector. So in that sense, uh, this equation is quite intuitive, right? Forget the past or not, take the input or not. That's basically it. Yeah. So this is a good question. Once you forget the past, uh, does it mean you forget grammar or something else? And the, the truth is this, we can't think of these forget gates as sort of absolutes. Uh, they're all vectors. And they will all forget only certain elements of a long hidden unit. And so really, um, I, I, I can eventually show you uh, what these hidden states look like. And sometimes they're actually more intuitive uh, than others. But it's rare that you will find like this particular unit when it was turned off or on actually had like this perfect interpretation that we as humans find intuitive and think of you know, as grammar. Also, of course, grammar is a very complex kind of uh, beast. And so it's hard to say any single unit would capture any particular, like the entirety of a grammar and might only capture certain things. So it's not implausible to think of like these three cells together suggest that the next noun should be a plural noun or something like that. But that's the most we could hope for in many cases. All right, and then here, uh, the final hidden state again, we can keep these Cs around, right? And Cs will compute uh, from our computer from other Cs, but we might not want to expose the content of this memory cell in order to give, uh, to compute the final hidden state, HT minus one. All right, now, yeah, this, this is it. This is the LSTM. It's, uh, it's a really powerful model. Are there any questions around the equations? We're gonna attempt at uh, you know, some illustrations, but again, I think the, the equations are sometimes more intuitive. Yeah. So does the LSTM and the GOU uh, completely alleviate uh, or just help with the vanishing curtain problem? And the truth is they help with it a lot, uh, but they don't completely alleviate it. Uh, they're still, you do multiply here a bunch of numbers that are often smaller than one, and over time, uh, you know, uh, even if it's, it would have to be a perfect one, but that would mean that that unit is really, really strongly active, and then it's hard to, you know, it sort of dies, right? It's like the gradient, um, when you have an, a unit that's really, really active and looks something like this, and you're now, the input is really large to that unit, and it's here, then, you know, gradient around here is pretty much zero. So that unit is kind of dead, and then the model can't do anything with it anymore. And so it's, it happens. There are, when once you train these, you'll observe some units just sort of die after training after a while, and they just always keep around stuff or always delete stuff at each time step. But uh, in general, uh, most of the units are still somewhat smaller than one, and so you still have a little bit of vanishing gradient problem, but much less so. And intuitively, you can come up even for, for NLP for a lot of good uh, ways uh, to, to think about this, right? Maybe you want to predict different things at different time steps, uh, but you want to keep around knowledge um, through the memory cells here, but not expose it at a given prediction. Yeah. What is the point of the exposure gate when it already has the forget gate? So uh, basically, you want to sort of forget gate will tell you whether you keep something around or not. But the exposure gate will mean, does it matter to this current time step or not? So you might not want to forget something, but 
you also might not want to show it to the current output because it's irrelevant for that output and will just confuse the softmax classifier at that output. Does the exposure gate help you, um, or you mean the output gate here, right? Um, so the output gate, does it help you to what exactly? To not have to forget everything forever. Um, so in some ways, yes, you can basically, this model could decide that while it doesn't want to give as output something for a long time, and hence it's technically it's basically a, a, a temporal forgetting, right? It will only be forgotten at that time step, but actually be kept around in, I don't want to use like anthropomorphize the models, but like the subconsciousness or whatever of this model, right? It's like keeps it around, but doesn't expose it. Don't quote me on that. All right, one last question. The initialization to all these models matters matters quite significantly. So if you initialize all your weights, for instance, such that whatever you do in the beginning, all of the weights are super large, then your gradients are zero and you're stuck in your optimization. So you always have to uh, op like initialize them properly. In most cases, as long as they're relatively small, you can't go too wrong. Eventually, it might slow down your eventual convergence, but as long as all your parameters W here and your word vectors and so on are initialized to very small numbers, it will usually eventually do pretty well. Yes, you could use lots of different strategies for initialization. Yeah. All right, now some visualizations. Um, I like this one from Chris Ola uh, on his blog uh, from not too long ago. Um, but again, I don't know, I feel like the equations speak, speak mostly for themselves. Uh, you can think of these, you know, you have four different neural network layers and then you combine them in various ways with pointwise operations uh, such as multiplication or addition and sometimes, you know, multiplication and then addition and concatenation and copies and so on. But in the end, you'll often observe this kind of thing where we'll just write LSTM in this block and has an X and an H and we don't really look too many into too many details uh, of what's going on there. And here's some, I think, even less helpful <laughs> illustrations um, that, yeah, I think are mostly confusing to, to a lot of people. Uh, you have the forget gates here, the output gates, input gates, and so on. But and your memory cells as they uh, try to yeah, modify each other. This one is a little cleaner. Uh, you know, you have some input, your gates, you have your forget gates uh, on top of your memory cell and so on. But in general, I think the, the equations are actually quite intuitive, right? If this is, you can think of the extremes, if this is zero or one, then this is, hap this, you know, this input matters more to the output. All right, now, like I said, LSTM's currently super hip, uh, the Unvoke model uh, for pretty much all sequence labeling tasks and sequence to sequence tasks like machine translation. Super powerful. Uh, in many cases, you'll actually observe that we'll stack them. Uh, so just like uh, the other RNN architectures, we'll have a whole LSTM block and we put another LSTM block with different sets of parameters on top of it. And then the parameters are shared over time, but are different uh, as you have a very deep model. And of course, with all these parameters here, uh, we have essentially you know, many more parameters than with the standard recurrent neural network where we only have two such parameters and we update every time. Uh, you want to have more data, especially if you stack them and you now have you know, 10x the parameters of a standard RNN. You really want to train this on a lot of data. And in terms of amount of training data available, machine translation is actually one of the best tasks uh, for that, and it's also the one where these models uh, sort of shine uh, the most. And so in 2015, uh, I think the first time I gave uh, the, the Deep Learning for NLP lecture, the jury was still a little bit out. Um, the neural network models came up uh, fairly quickly, but uh, some different other, like more traditional machine translation systems uh, were still slightly better, like by half a blue point. Uh, we, had, we haven't defined blue scores yet, and you can essentially think of it as an n-gram overlap. The more your translation overlaps in terms of you know, unigrams and bigrams and trigrams, the better it likely is um, 
period. So you have a, a reference translation, sometimes multiple reference translations. You have your translation. You look at n-gram overlap between the two. So the higher, the better. And uh, basically, the neural network models were often also just used for rescoring a uh, traditional MT model. Now, just one year later, last year, uh, really a couple of months ago, uh, the story was completely different. So this is a WMT, uh, the uh, competition, worldwide uh, competition for machine translation. And you have uh, different universities and uh, different companies and so on submit their systems. And the top three systems were all neural machine translation systems. So the jury is now basically not out anymore. It's clear neural machine translation is the most accurate machine translation uh, model in the world. Yeah, that number two was us, yeah. Uh, James Bradbury and, and me uh, worked on that. Yeah. Um, James Bradbury was actually a linguistics undergrad while he was doing that, but now he's full time. So, so yeah, um, basically, uh, we haven't talked that much about ensembling and ensembles of different models, but uh, you can also train five of these monsters and then average all the probabilities, and you'll usually get a little better, which is a general thing you'll observe for every competition, machine learning competition out there. If you go on Kaggle or other machine learning competitions, usually training even the same kind of model five times, you end up in slightly different local optima, you average, and you still do pretty well. Uh, what's cool also, though, is that uh, while we might not be able to exactly recover grammar or have specific units be uh, explicitly sort of capturing uh, very intuitive things. As we project this down, similar to the word vectors, we actually do observe some pretty interesting regularities. So here we projected, uh, or um, this is a paper from Setskever in 2014, uh, they projected a different sentences that were trained basically with a machine translation uh, task. And basically observed quite interesting regularities. So John admires Mary, is close to John is in love with Mary, and to John respects Mary. Now, of course, we have to be a little careful here to not overinterpret the amazingness. It's amazing, but we also have a selection bias here, right? Maybe if we just had uh, John did admire Mary or something, it might also be close to it, right? And it might be closer too. But if you just uh, project these six particular sentences into the into a lower dimensional space, then you do see very nicely that whenever John uh, has some positive feelings for Mary, uh, all those sentences are in here. And all the ones that uh, are on this, uh, in this area of the you know, first two eigenvectors, uh, Mary admires John, Mary is in love with John, and Mary respects John. Uh, they're all closer together, which is kind of amazing. Because uh, some people are also worried, well, it's a sequence model, so how could it ever capture that you know, the word order changes? And so this is a particular cool example for that. So here we have, she was given a card by me in the garden versus in the garden I gave her a card. And I gave her a card in the garden. And despite the word order being actually flipped, right, in the garden is in the beginning here and in the end here, these are still closer together than the different ones where in the garden, basically, she gave me a card versus um, I gave her a card. So that shows that the semantics here turn out to be more important than the word order, despite the model just going from left to right, or this one was still with the trick where we reverse the order of the input sentence. But it shows us that it, it's incredibly invariant, and invariance is a pretty important concept, right? We want this model to be invariant to simple syntactic uh, changes when the semantics are actually kept the same, it's pretty incredible that, that it does that. So this is uh, also the power, I think, of some of these. This is a very deep LSTM model where you have five different LSTM blocks stacked in the encoder and several in the decoder, and they're all connected uh, at multiple places, too. All right, any questions around those visualizations and LSTMs? All right, you now have uh, knowledge under your belt that is, that is super powerful and very interesting. I expected to maybe have five minutes more of time, so I'm going to talk to you about a recent improvement uh, to recurrent neural networks that I think is also very applicable to machine translation, but nobody has actually yet applied it to machine translation. And that is uh, a general problem with all softmax classification 
that we do in all the models I've so far described to you, and really up until two or three months ago that everybody in NLP had as, as a major problem. And that is, you can only ever predict answers if you saw that exact word at training time. And you had your cross-entropy error saying, I want to predict this word. And if you've never predicted that word, no matter how obvious it is for the translation system, it will not be able to do it, right? So we have some kind of translation, and let's say we have a new word, like a new name or something that we've never seen at, uh, at training time. And it's very obvious that this word here should go you know, at this location. Like This is like Mrs. and then maybe the new word is like Yellen or something like that. Could be any, any other word. And now let's say at training time we've never seen the word Yellen, but now you know it's like Frau, the German Mrs. Uh, uh, Miss in, in yeah, German translation for this. And now it's very obvious to everybody that after you know this word it should be the next one, the name of the of the Miss. And so like these models would never be able to do that, right? Uh, and so one way to fix that is to think about character translation models where the model is actually surprisingly similar to what we described here, um, well, a lot many time steps ago, but instead of having words, we just have characters. So that's one way, but now you have very long sequences, and at every character, you have a lot of matrix multiplications. And these matrix multiplications that we have in here are not you know, 50 dimensional. Uh, for really powerful MT models, they're 1,000 dimensional. And now you have several thousand by a thousand uh, matrices here multiplying with thousand dimensional vectors and you stack them so you have you do it five times. If doing that for every single character actually gets really, really expensive. Um, so at the same time, it's very intuitive that after we see a new word at test time, we want to be able to predict it. And also in general, when we have the softmax, even for words that we do see once or twice, it's hard for the model to then still predict them. It's the skewed data set uh, distribution problem that you have very rare, very infrequent classes or words are hard to predict for the models. And so this is uh, one attempt at fixing that, which is essentially a mixture model of using a standard softmax and what we call a pointer. So what's a pointer? It's essentially a mechanism to say, well, maybe my next word is one of, my pr one of the previous words in the context, you say, say 100 words in the past, and at every time step you say, maybe I just want to copy a word over from one of the last 100 words, and if not, then I will use my standard softmax for the rest. So this is kind of this sentinel idea here. This is a uh, paper uh, by Stephen Meredy and some other folks. And basically, we now have a mixture model where we combine the probabilities from the standard vocabulary and from this pointer. And now how do we compute this pointer? It's very straightforward. We basically have a query. Uh, this query is just a modification of the last hidden layer that we have here. And we pipe that through a standard single layer neural network to compute another hidden layer, which we call Q. And then we'll do an inner product between this Q and all the previous hidden states of the last 100 time steps. And that will give us basically a single number for each of these inner products, and then we'll apply a softmax on top of that. And this gives us essentially a probability for how likely do we want to point to each of these words, or, uh, and the very last one is we don't point to anything, we just take uh, the standard softmax. So we keep one unit around where we do this. And now, of course, in the context, is the same word might appear multiple times, and so you'll just sum up all the probabilities for specific words. If they appear multiple times, you just sum them up. Now, with this simple modification, we now have the ability to predict unseen words. We can predict, based on the pattern of how rare words appear, much more uh, similar things. So, for instance, the you know, Fed, Fed chair Janet Yellen raised rates and so on misses. It's very obvious that this is the same miss that we're referring to here. And uh, you can basically combine this in this mixture model. And now, over many, many years for language modeling, uh, the perplexity that we defined before was sort of stuck actually around, uh, around 80. Uh, and then in 2015, we have a bunch of modifications to LSTMs that were very powerful and lowered this. 
And now uh, we're down to the low 70s, and with some modifications we'll cover in another class, uh, we're actually down in the 60s now. So it really had plateaued for several years, and now perplexity numbers are really dropping, and these models are getting better and better at capturing more and more of the semantics and the syntax uh, of, of language. All right, so let's summarize. Recurrent neural networks, super powerful. You now know the best ones in that family, GRUs and LSTMs. This is a pretty advanced lecture. I hope you gained some of the intuition. Again, most of the math falls uh, out from the same basic building blocks we had before. And next, uh, next week, or no, next Thursday, we'll do midterm review. All right, thank you.